Why cinematography? Of all the careers you could have had, and any of you may answer this, why cinematography? I had too much energy to be an editor. I couldn't sit still long enough. I had no talent as a director. And I liked, I liked being on the set with actors. Felt like I was playing with kids in a sandbox. But when I went home at night, I could sleep, whereas the director got the phone calls from the actors saying, I can't do this scene in the morning. And they would have to worry about those things. And I didn't have to worry about them. I felt like, unlike a writer, who had to face an empty page every day. When I got to the set, there was an entire crew waiting to work with me. So I just thought it felt like the best job in the world. Um, I can mostly agree with that. Being able to work with a crew of people to create something, and also the way that you know you can manipulate light and work with lenses and, and filters and everything is just very. It's like, it's like you said, playing in a sandbox. You have to play with these big toys. Like I played with Legos as a kid, so it's like playing with big kid Legos. Big kid Legos, I like that. Um, let's see. Uh, growing up, I was always that kid that tinkered around with toys and tools, and I don't know. I never really did the things little girls are supposed to do. I I built things. I was always putting the electronics together for people in the family, whatever. Um, let's see. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I'm not a cinematographer, though. I I love cinematography. I have wonderful cinematographer bosses, but uh, the Steadicam just came so natural to me. I've always just wanted to do what the boys would do, and I felt like when I went to school. Thank goodness for universities. I took a workshop and it was my calling. And I got to go to work every day and build steady cams and build camera systems. And that's where I just fit right into what I wanted to do. So, yeah, the kids where you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just kind of fell into it. I did have an interest in photography, but. I think I decided to be a camera assistant, really having no idea what a camera assistant was or what we did. And uh, luckily, I loved it. How did you train for your uh, career? What prepared you? Did you go to school? Are you self-taught? I did go to SF State, but they're not, at the time, they weren't a very technical school. Mm -hmm. And so I just started working on student shoots. And um, and then after that, it was on the job training, working as a production assistant and schmoozing the camera department, hanging out with them when I could, bringing them coffee and just trying to learn from them as, as I could. And then, um, you know, eventually the camera assistant started to invite me along as like a camera PA. And uh, so pretty much all my training was a little bit of student shoots and then all just on professional shoots. How did you train to become a professional cinematographer slash steady cam operator? Oh, um, uh, the best part of training I ever had was um, I took a workshop in college back in 2004. And the instructor of my workshop, uh, I don't know, had a soft spot for me or something. I just kept plugging him. I wouldn't put down the steady cam. And I just became friends with him to where he said I could assist him the next two years he came back to the school. So every time he came back, I assisted and helped out. And then I told him I was moving to Los Angeles. And he helped me line up an interview at the Steady Camp Factory in Glendale. And I went into that interview and walked out with a job. Very and good. I actually helped assemble these rigs. And it was amazing. I didn't know anything about anything, really. I just knew that I loved putting things together. I learned about different tool sizes to, you know, what bearings are for, what type of bearings. All those things are very crucial to my career today. Mm -hmm. Once I was done at the Steadicam factory, I moved on and started working at Panavision Hollywood. And I learned in order to be a good Steadicam operator, you must first be a good camera operator. So I had to learn the ins and outs of cameras and filters and matte boxes and magazines. And, and then eventually, 
thought I was ready to go freelance. But it took two years to build up that confidence, to build up those contacts, and to be ready to touch that really expensive equipment. And now when I'm on set, on a big shoot, I'm flying $300,000 worth of gear on my body. And I have to be confident. Running backwards. <laughs> Very good. So, um, well, I, yes. I went to school here at the academy. So I was one of you sitting in the audience uh, about four and a half years ago. Um, so I got training here and worked on student films. Also, before I graduated, I really pushed to work on professional shoots. So I did that as well. But so I'm a little bit, um, you know, I wouldn't say self-taught because you learn from others on set, but both with school and working with other people taught me. I um I have so many degrees I can't count anymore because it took me a long time to figure out that I really wanted to be in cinematography. So I I have a BA degree in psychology and then I have a master's degree in education. I taught special ed for a number of years. But something always in the back of my mind was you want to be in cinematography. Um, or you want to be in film. That's what I knew. Uh, from my father shooting uh, home movies, uh, eight millimeter home movies. Not video high eight, eight millimeter. And um, I very much uh, like mechanics of it. Like how to thread the camera, how to thread the projector. Um, so after I realized that I was not, that I actually got, got bored in my other careers, and I kept thinking, there's something more out there for me. It's, I, I'm not fulfilled. And I needed a career, I think, that took both, um, required something that was intellectual and something physical, because I, I needed to be engaged in both of those areas. Um, so after a number of years, uh, I just decided that I would go to, I would apply to a program in which, at Temple University in Philadelphia, and it was basically a documentary program, and we did everything. We were the director, we were the producer, and we shot, uh, and we were also the cinematographer. Uh, after that, it became pretty obvious to me that it was the camera work that I really was most in, um, interested in. So a few years later, I had a friend who moved to LA and went to the American Film Institute as a director, and then I moved to LA and I applied to American Film Institute as a cinematographer and, and that I, I, first I worked on other people's shoots and then I really knew this was it. I applied to the school I got in and then that started my professional career. After I graduated, I started out as a second camera assistant and moved up to a first and um, then it became obvious to me that if I continued on this long pathway, I would probably be pretty old by the time I got to be a cinematographer, going through all the different ranks. So I thought, you know what, I'm not going to go up the ranks anymore, I'm just going to go out and shoot. And, and I had to make the break because I was making a decent living, I was in the union, and I was making a decent living as being um, a, a, a first camera assistant. But then to split from that and say, okay, I can't be an assistant in the union and also call myself a cinematographer. Um, I had to leave that, and then I, and that was scary because it's freelance. And as we were talking about, Jeffrey, you have to start building contacts. So people only knew me as a camera assistant. They're just like, well, Linda's not a cinematographer. She's a camera assistant. So you have to kind of let that go for a number of years. That reputation dies. You shoot a lot of free projects. There's no money coming in. It was basically, I was just making contacts. So shooting student projects, indie films, and then after that, um, I started to shoot and also teach at the same time. So I, I always like going back and forth between teaching and shooting. But then there was a run there for about um, 15 years that I was exclusively shooting. And then when I was, because it's freelance, when I wasn't busy, I was also teaching. And then that's eventually how it turned into being a full-time teaching position now. Thank you. You probably have answered this question, but to be sure, how long did it take you to feel confident enough to there an aha moment on set where you said, ah, I feel like a professional and I'm not worried anymore in terms of being able to do this job. I know there is some worry at the beginning of every job. Not that kind of nervousness. But when did you truly feel like a professional cinematographer? 
in all the capacities that you were? I think it took me quite a few years. Um, maybe finally after when I got into the union. Um, yeah, it, I don't. It took a long time, I think. But it's true. Sometimes even now, my confidence will wane. It'll be stronger at some times than at others. How long did it take you uh, to feel like you could make a living? Oh, maybe. And do this job professionally and well. Maybe three years. You know, the first couple of years we're working as a production assistant and low budget um, shoots as a camera assistant. So it was maybe three or four years, and then I thought, okay, it's possible. <laughs> you were talking about this earlier. Yeah. That's why we're laughing. Uh, for me, in the steady cam world and camera operating, I guess I think you always have to be confident in yourself, no matter what, when you're exploring new ground, new territory, something that really hasn't been done by other people like you before you. Um, I don't know, like. I've been in LA trying for this career for nine years. I've been working as a steady cam operator for six and a half. I am now at a point where I feel like I can live, I can survive, I can pay my bills. I have an overhead payment of the steady cam every month that I have to take care of on top of my rent, on top of our, on top of all these other bills. Um, I was just saying earlier, I've reached the point of no return. I've now invested too much time. I've invested too much of my life. But everything I think about, from the bed I sleep on, to the shoes I wear, to the food I eat, it's all based around my career and me being able to do my job. Because, face it, sometimes when I go on set, people automatically, it's just an assumption that I can't do my job. So I have to, literally within seconds, prove not only to myself, but everybody else in the room that they made a good choice hiring me, that I, I can carry the pounds of my body comfortably and compose this show the way that they need it. So I have to be confident in myself really every day, no matter what. And it, it sucks because I was just doing a big commercial shoot two weeks ago for Roman Coppola's company, the Directors Bureau. And I, was, I was like praying to the gods of cinema. I was like, please don't let me mess this up. I, I know I can do this. 18 steps backwards, down the stairs with a fully built Aerie Alexa XT with a <laughs> ultra prime lens, I think, with a Cinetape, a ball of focus, all of it. And it was like five hours straight, 18 steps backwards. And it's a little kid dancing around on the stairs. Just I had to keep him in frame and also move at a certain pace and fight the grip who's trying to stop me from what he thinks is me falling, but really I'm just stepping backwards. So yeah, it's it's hard because it was like an part of my French, but it was an oh shit moment. Like, how am I going to make the best of this day when everything's working against me? And I just, I just, I don't know. Thank goodness I love my job. I, I just pulled through and it worked out. It worked out great. And at the end of the day, I just thank you, thank you, thank you. I can go on to do another day. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Um, I'd say it took me about. About two years, but I think, you know, you're always developing your skills. Um, also, once you start getting comfortable with the gear and familiar with it, and you understand how it works, you understand every everything works slightly differently. So once you get comfortable with that, I think then you get that confidence. I'm showing up to work because I I second primarily, and a lot of times I don't get brought onto prep. So what's nerve-wracking nerve for me is that I'll show up to work, and granted, I'll work with the same crew, but some of the gear might be slightly different. But knowing how to come on the set and tackle and organize your stuff the way you want it organized, and to know where everything is, I think, you know, being able to show up to work feeling confident is really when you develop your Well, they all beat me, because Sometimes I go into set and I still don't feel confident. Um, I think my whole career, you know, as you're telling your stories, memories were coming back into my mind of days that I showed up on the set in various positions along the way, um, and I and I I, I I did not do well. And 
I think the hard part of it is that night that you go home and you know you did not do a good job that day, how do you get back up the next day and make the phone call for the next job? That's the tough part because when we're when our careers are going like this, that's not an issue. It's the down times, it's the, it's the challenging times of saying, maybe you're not made to do this, maybe you're not good enough, maybe somebody else is better than you. How do you have the nerve to get on the phone tomorrow and ask somebody to hire you when you know the day before you did not do as good a job as you would have liked to have done? And so there's, in my life, there's been a lot of doubt and it's just saying, and a lot of self, a lot of support from friends. We were talking about this earlier. Having a support group around you, having other people that you go to. I still do that with with my colleagues, uh, and say, you know, I'm not sure if I'm doing this right. Help me out. I see myself as constantly asking questions, learning about things, um, and so I don't know if we ever, if I ever feel like I'm truly on top of it. I just, and, and I actually think that when you start to feel that way that you're probably not stretching. That maybe it's okay to be insecure and vulnerable because that means you're really pushing yourself to the next limit. I've been on sets where I've seen cinematographers who seem almost to me overly secure and I'm a little suspicious of that because I'm thinking, are they trying anything new or are they just trying what they've already done? So, so although I can't say it feels great or it feels comfortable to be, insecure or, or frightened or vulnerable, it's what I normally feel and so I almost am getting used to it and, and it keeps me engaged and interested. Mm -hmm. What has been the most rewarding aspect of your work? Now that we have all the down. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean to make it down. <laughs> Um, I, I think it's just being able to make a living in San Francisco. Um, there's not as much work up here as down in LA. And um, and I have known a lot of people who've left the Bay Area to go down to LA um, because they want more work or to work on different kinds of projects. Um, so it just feels good to live in a city that I love and feel like I've been able to make it work. Uh, it is possible. There's not a whole bunch of us they're making it work, but um, but it is possible. Um, I guess the most rewarding part of my career is literally right now. I'm I'm proud of myself for making it this far. I've wanted to throw in the towel so many times. <laughs> Sometimes I sit. I haven't worked in eight days. I've been ready to throw in the towel just because as a freelancer. You haven't worked in a few days, you're wondering if you're ever going to work again. But it, it all takes time. Nothing's going to happen overnight. And honestly, nobody wants to hire some really excited, naive kid willing to do everything. They want you to have the experience. They want you to have the body of work. They want you to have the reputation. You know, oh, well, I like working with them because of this reason or that reason. Or look at their work. Look at the wheel. Look at what they've shot. It's like now, after six and a half years of working as a full-time steady cam operator when the work came. Now, today, I feel like I can, again, survive. I, if there's so much more to go, I'm still in the toddler phases of steady cam, but I, I can live and survive. I'm not sleeping in my car anymore. I am actually paying my bills and I'm getting ahead. Um, I definitely would say, uh, the people that you meet are really amazing. You end up spending a lot of time with a lot of different people, and everybody, for the most part, everybody is so amazing. There's everybody, when you start working with really, really talented people, it just becomes more rewarding for you as like a team. And um, also, some of the more rewarding, rewarding experiences than just driving home after a really long, really, really hard day on the beach where you've been hauling carts around on the sand for 15 hours maybe. Not every day is 15 hour day. But, um, and then just being like, well, I mean, I'm, I, I'm small, 
and I carry like a lot of heavy stuff. I work with a lot of bigger people. <laughs> a lot of money. <laughs> um, so sometimes it's as simple as that, and you kind of, you know, sometimes it can wear on you. But if you take out those little moments when you're driving home and you take a breath, it's really rewarding to be like, I did that. I don't know if this exactly answers the question, but I had an experience a number of years ago that I just want to share with you. And I was um, always concerned about that I really loved the scripts that I worked on. And so I was very picky about, um, oh, I don't want to work on this because it's really not a very good script, or I don't like the way they treat women in this script. And so I was very selective on, on what I w was willing to shoot. And so, I, but there aren't a lot of good scripts out there, folks. They're very rare. I mean, very, very rare. And so I wasn't working a lot. And finally, I was on a show. It was a short with some fantastic actors. Um, and I ate lunch with one of the, the actors that I really um, wanted to talk with. And I asked him, he was in his 70s at this point, and I said to him, Sean, um, wh why are you working on this show? And he said to me, come here, I want to tell you something. And he said, you know, Linda, if you work on two or three good scripts in your whole life, that's fantastic. Writing is really hard. And so what you have to do, any script that you read, you have to find a scene or something in that script that you can connect with. And it might just be one scene. And then you make that everything the best that you can make it. And if the rest of the film is just mediocre and you're doing an okay job, that's still more, you're, you've still grown. You've still uh, stretched yourself and you've still given yourself to that one scene. And I was so humbled by this man sharing this with me because I was being pretty stormy about, you know, hey, I'm, you know. And here's this gentleman in his 70s, a very accomplished actor, working on a short film, and I watched, and he did find certain scenes that he really put himself into, and it changed my attitude completely. I was not any longer sitting home waiting for the script, because I knew what I needed to do was find something in every script. And um, then I had experience. I had shot more, then I would be shooting more films, so that when the really good script came along, uh, that I really wanted to shoot, I could say to the director, I have a lot of experience, and they could see in my reel the experience that I had. So that was a big wake-up call, and I think that in an odd way, it was when I felt like I became a professional. Yeah. Thank you. Is there any aspect of your training or prep for this career that you would change or do differently now that you're a working professional? One thing you wish you'd done, learned, prep for? I wish that I had shot more in college. Mm -hmm. I assisted on a lot of projects. Mm -hmm. I was constantly, I even made my classes like a Tuesday, Wednesday, so I could, you know, prep Friday or shoot Friday and work through Sunday, Monday. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what I wish I had done because mm -hmm. I want to be a cinematographer. And right now, currently on, on the way, I still shoot free stuff on the side when I can, but when you're in school, you don't have to worry about as many bills mm -hmm. as when you get out. So, and, and kind of what you're touching on, mm -hmm. shooting everything that you can, mm -hmm. um, because you will find something and you will benefit from it in one way or another. That's the only thing I would change otherwise. I don't, I mean, it it's really sucks having all the tuition bills from school. <laughs> I, I wish I could have bypassed it, but I can't because that's where I learned about Steadicam. That's where I fell in love with it. So without all that, I would not be here today. But I think that a lot of what I've learned in college is more about like theory and history, which I'm very grateful for. And I, you know, have an obsession with silent films, silent film cameras, which I would have never learned without college. But damn, sixty thousand dollars in debt just is very hard to survive with in Los Angeles when you're poor, when you're living in your car, when you're trying to 
follow your dreams. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I have I have no regrets. I don't want to change anything, but mm -hmm. I wish I could have learned something online or in a book <laughs> without having to go through four and a half years of school. Mm -hmm. But I could take a lot of ways. <laughs> Sorry, to be honest. <laughs> um, I actually wouldn't change anything that I did. Um, and then something I wanted to share is that I felt like an event that helped me get onto my path as a camera assistant is that I was a location PA on a movie called The Doors that uh, starred Val Kilmer. And I was there during the day literally just to pick up garbage. They were doing these big concert scenes with thousands of extras. And um, so they had people preparing the location during the day, and then they would be shooting at night. So I worked all day picking up garbage, and then I was wrapped right at the main call time for the crew. So I went straight to the camera truck and walked on, and some second AC looked at me and said, oh, hey, can I help you? And I said, well, I just got wrapped. I'm a location PA, and I'm wondering if I can come help you on set at all. And he said, sure. So I went, helped him out just for like half an hour at a camera that was right in front of the stage. So it was lot, lots of fun. But I had to leave early because I was going on vacation to LA the next day with my parents. And then um, got down to LA. A few days later, I went to Panavision because I wanted to learn how to load mags. And who do I run into but this camera assistant I had met on oh. the doors. Oh. And he said, oh, I'm prepping with a camera assistant from the Bay Area. You should come meet him. So I went and met this other assistant. His name is Pat McArdle. He's like an A-list assistant um, based in the Bay Area. So I hung out and prepped with them for the day. And I just, I basically labeled cases for them, which was a new thing to me. And then they said, why don't you come hang out on the set tomorrow? <laughs> so I went and hung out on the set moved the monitors around, did that for two days, and then the producer came up and said, hey, we could use your help. You want to stay on for the rest of the job? I'll pay you 50 bucks a day. And I said, sure. So my parents flew back home so they could leave me the car, and I stayed Excellent. down there and worked for three weeks on a TV movie, and, um, and then that kind of got me going because I had met these assistants, and then things kind of went from there. But I just like to point out how I feel like my career kind of got really started because I was picking up garbage as a location <laughs> game. So. Thank you. Um, has there been anything about this industry that has surprised you or been different than what you expected at the start of your career? <laughs> Freelancing is very hard. <laughs> very hard from the beginning, but... Um, you have to learn how to not stress too much about it. When if you, we were talking about the failure too, mm -hmm. we talked about a lot earlier, but um, you have to learn how to balance the stress of, am I gonna work, am I not gonna work? You may work twice in one week, and you might have a week off. You may work six or seven days in a row, and it's amazing, then you have this week off, and you're like, oh my gosh, when is going to call me? Did I do something wrong? Like, you get in your own head about it, and I didn't realize that you know, when you're basically taking care of yourself, in, in terms of your work, it gets very, very stressful. Um, but once you get in with the crew, if you work really hard, it doesn't, as long as you work really hard, you're gonna work. Like, you're gonna meet more people, take, you know, take every, I took every job that I could take, and um, drove back and forth from San Francisco to LA three or four times a month just to build up contacts before I move down, but you have to do that. You have to, you have to really push yourself and push yourself hard. So. What was the question? <laughs> oh, what's different than what you what expected I said. at the beginning of your career? I didn't really know what to expect, mm -hmm. but um, I think I didn't know about the hours. We work really long days, 12 hours, is normal. 14 is also very normal. Um, uh, and I think that's a thing probably that I wasn't really prepared for. You know, something that I found surprising was I had, as I said before, I had numerous degrees. So I was into 
you know, education and, you know, being around people who had degrees. And what I found kind of surprising was when you work on a big Hollywood production, you're working with folks who are felons and folks who are educated. And you are working with everyone in between. Um, and you have to figure out, how am I going to, because you spend incredible number of hours with them. I mean, in, in a week, there were weeks I was working 75 hours in a week um, on a production. And so it became very clear to me, how do I figure out how to work with these people for 75 hours a week and enjoy myself. Because if you're not enjoying yourself, you're spending a lot of time with people you don't want to be spending time with. And I had some very um, incredible experiences on a set. I remember I was working once with this guy who was a grip, and so it's the whole joke, you know, his pants were down low and it's the butt crack thing. And, you know, I had multiple degrees, so I'm so much better than he is, and that was my mindset. And so one day I was talking to a friend of mine who was doing um, sound, and we were talking about hair color and henna. And this guy came over and he said to me, um, well, that's not the good color. And I just thought, oh, he's just being really a smart ass, and he doesn't know what we're talking about. And I blew him off. And um, his boss came over to me later, who was a gaffer, and I liked this guy because he was helping give me information and teaching me about lighting. And he called me over and he said, you know, I want to tell you something. And I said, yeah. And he said, um, you know, he used to do hair and makeup before he became a grip. I said, are you serious? And he said, yeah, and then he, then he quit that, and now he's a grip. And he says, and besides that, every Sunday, he goes to visit his mom, who's in a nursing home, and he gives perms and he dyes the, the women's hair free of charge. He just does this out of the kindness of his heart. And I just thought, oh, Miss Smarty Pants here, you know? She thinks she's so much. And so I really learned that Maybe it's, you know, being at USC and being with all these people who are all educated and stuff, maybe there's another way to look at being on a film set and not judge people, but really keep yourself open to what is it you can learn about people and their humanity? Because that's what the films we're working on is all about. You know, great stories about people being, people's humanity and, and and um, care for other people. And I was thinking I was above that. So that was a real wake up call to me to say, be where you are in the moment where you're at and really understand what, what it is you say you're doing, which is making movies to have people understand their hearts better. Because I was getting out of sync with that. And um, it was a brutal way to have that wake up call. And I'm grateful for that guy now. And I still remember his low pants and everything else about him. But it was I really learned a lot about my heart and what I thought I was doing on the set. Would you like to pass? <laughs> or would you like to answer? <laughs> And what surprised you about working in this industry after you had some years under your belt that you could never expect? When I graduated college, I uh, expected things to happen within three years. Honestly, I was like, I gave myself a three year, and I'm like, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll get out there in three years. I'll be working. I'll survive. I'll make it. And here we are, almost ten years, and I now getting close to what I thought I could do in three years. Um, but uh, I find the support system is definitely more than what I expected. I didn't even know that it, it existed. Um, I surround myself by people that are positive and a good influence in this industry. People, I'm very persistent too. If people are a little too busy, then I I'll contact you every other week until you're willing mm -hmm. to talk to me. And that's kind of how I did it in the Steadicam world. I have like 10 different mentors. And I've contacted a lot of Steadicam ops. Half of them never return my call, nor, you know, would have the time, or some of them don't want to return my call. But the ones that did were very open to 
showing me the ropes, letting me try on their, their steady cams, um, introducing me to their families, like really welcomed me into their homes and their lives. And my closest friends in this world are other steady cam operators. One of my closest friends, I actually babysit his children sometimes when he and his wife want to go and have a normal night to themselves. Um, one of my, my very first mentor, I believe some of you guys know, his name's Peter Abraham. He was the one that goes to all these different campuses, different universities um, around the United States and gets younger people into a rig. And if it weren't for him, and to this day, here we are, 10 and a half, 11 years later, and I still talk to him. I actually just referred him a job. Yeah, and it was like, it was, it was very rewarding to have that go full circle. And so it's nice to have a support system um, because there's a lot of negativity around it. And that support system has helped me block out all the stuff that people want to say, oh, you can't do it, oh, you're not good enough, oh, you can't carry it for that long. I, I get all that all the time. So I just pick up the phone and call them when I'm having, you know, a little tip or I'm frustrated and they say just stay the course and just be patient and keep doing what you're doing. So that's that's a, what I can say for everybody. Just stay the course, focus, and don't let anybody stop you, but also be patient. It's not going to happen overnight. And that's definitely another thing that I didn't expect. I thought, you know, someone's going to hire me. Yeah, but it's a saturated market. Nobody wants to pay people. I mean, there's so many reasons why you would want to throw in that towel. But again, just mentors. Find mentors. Reach out to people. I, some people I've never met until, like, they got a Facebook page, and then I started messaging them. Next thing you know, I had coffee with somebody, and they referred me a good job after so many years of staying in contact. So you never know. Thank you. Now, a fun question. What has been the strangest job that you've had working in the cinematography uh, department? The strangest gig? Well, as a camera assistant, I did a music video. Um, I forget the name of the artist, unfortunately, but um, you know the TV show Cheaters? Uh, like the Muppet version of Cheaters. <laughs> that was probably the weirdest thing I've ever done. That's good. The best job and the strangest job is I did a swingers convention in San Diego. Hey. Sin City. Nancy Schreiber called me one weekend. I was with my family on the East Coast, and she said to me, Linda, I have this job. I can't do it. And I would like to know if you would do it for me. And I said, what is it? And she said, there's a big international, the biggest swingers convention at a hotel in San Diego. And I said, well, that's kind of interesting. And um, she said, I'll give you the job under one condition. After you do it, you gotta tell me what it was like. And it was it was a very, very interesting job. And, um, and Nancy called me immediately and said, okay, fess up, what was it like? And it was fun, it was a lot of fun, but I learned a tremendous amount. <laughs> And I'll explain it later at the, the right. reception. <laughs> Over a few drinks. <laughs> Good. Your swingers convention is coming up. <laughs> Strangest job? Well, if she went with the swingers route, then I, I think I can say what I'm about to say. <laughs> I, I showed up to shoot these... Um, not steady cam, just camera. But I was told that these are educational how to videos. Okay. Yeah, it's how to love your lover. Let's see. Were you paid well? I was paid very well. Very good. Very good. Very, very well. Good. There, there's just some things where, you know what, just take the job. It's, it was practice, it was training, uh, equal opportunity. But yeah, it, it was... What kind of practice? <laughs> <laughs> practice of following the motion and holding the camera. <laughs> okay. I think we get the picture. Yeah. <laughs> if you could change anything about the profession of cinematography, what would it be? 
uh, stop thinking about the gear so much and think about how to use the gear to tell the story. So don't get enamored with the stuff, the tools. I love tools, but I find that we, including myself, get just too um, addicted to the tools and we forget about uh, what, this, what the story is. I'm going to agree with that. If you could change anything about the profession of cinematography, what would it be? We were just talked about this earlier. Um, I think having too much control is maybe not a good thing. So if you're a cinematographer and you have two or three cameras, it's probably a safe place from my recommendation as a camera operator who works under you. For you as a cinematographer to be in Video Village, watch it every bit of the frame, every bit of the lighting. You don't want anything to slip through the cracks or a mistake to go by because you can't see it because you're operating a camera or you're directing at the same time. I, I've been on set where they're the director, the DP, and the camera operator all in one, and you can see things going on in the background that they're missing. So it's, it's not my place to say anything, but you know, when there's too much going on, it's safe bet is to be where you're most needed and your name is going on this stuff. It's you know professional work. So it should be like that, the outcome. I'd like to get rid of GoPros. <laughs> <laughs> Why? I don't think I need to explain. I see. Thank you very much. Are any of you uh, members of any women's cinematography or film organizations, and has that benefited you at all? Actually, we were talking about this earlier. We know people in common, Jennifer and I. Um, uh, back in the 80s, there was a group that formed in LA right after the um, Olympics were shot in LA. It was called Women Behind the Lens. And um, I joined that organization, and it, was it, it came at a really critical time in my career. I just needed to, I needed to learn a lot. And, and not necessarily about the um, equipment or um, I needed to learn in a, how to function on a set, protocol on a set. That's a, and, and there are no books written about this. Uh, what do you say? What don't you say? Who do you talk to? How much do you reveal? How quiet are you? How, how verbal are you? Um, this, is a, this will make or break your early career. When, once you get known, you can kind of act out as much as you want and people forgive you. But when you're first starting out, you need to know how this happens, and there's no way to learn it except to go on the set and sometimes make the mistake. And so this was an organization that I was in it, it with, with other women who were more experienced than I was and kind of took me under their wing, getting back to what you were saying about mentors and stuff, and said, I'll bring you onto the set, but this is how you have to function on the set. This is what you need to be, you know, not heard, but you just do your job, and, and also as a day player, knowing how to go onto a set where you don't know the other people, and you don't accidentally say something about somebody who then turns out to be the girlfriend of the directors, and so that was the wrong person to say something about. So there are a lot of these kind of interpersonal skills that I think are very important to being successful on a set that we rarely learn, and um, I think they can make or break your early career. Um, to piggyback off of what you're saying, that behind the lens uh, organization went away, but I don't know if you know, but there is a, a Facebook community group for camera women that we started uh, about three or four years ago called The camera Internet women. Version of Behind the Lens, right? The, yes. the newer version. It's called Camera Women Los Angeles. You, um, Women can request to be in it. Uh, I'm one of the administrators. It was a group put together by Beth Corey, Beth Dubber Corey, who is a union still photographer, who just did last month's issue of ICG magazine. She did the cover. Um, but yes, it's uh, about 440 women strong, and we're only on Facebook. We never really got around to doing a website. But um, I try and organize events. I usually do the events for the group. If anybody else does it, that's 
really good, but Beth and I usually do mixers or uh, I got Band Pro to do a uh, workflow day with the F65 for our group. And I'm working on getting a one day intensive like steady cam workshop for the women over at the steady cam factory. Ari always provides us, you know, a, a demo hands on day with the uh, refreshments for our all women group. Can so, I do it? Yes, you should can. <laughs> yes, you just type in Camera Women Los Angeles and then we'll like. They all join? All women can join. I'm sorry, fellas, you got your own groups out there. <laughs> but. Uh, Yes, you can join, and I can, we, a few of us can review your profile pages and accept you. But it's definitely a community where I didn't do it. I didn't do it. <laughs> but it's a community where, if there's an issue involving harassment, it's been discussed on there. If other women need to pass other women work, it's on there. And even just regular topics like. Um, there's a, a write-up about uh, Lisa Wheeland, and she is the cinematographer newly inducted to the ASC, and she's a cinematographer on Chicago Fire TV Lisa show. was my student at AFI. Ah, I very love nice. Lisa. So I just posted an article about her to the group. So it's like women topics, women group. Yes. Uh, I'm not a member. Okay. Yeah. Any group. Okay. Oh, I'm, also, sorry. You can join those. Yes. Yeah. I'm not on Facebook. No. One of those. I'm also a member of the Society of Camera Operators, which Hugh back there is also, he's our educational chair. Very good. So it, it takes about, uh, you, anybody can join the SOC as an associate member, whether you're a friend of the organization, you have the interest in cinematography or if you're an assistant or a DP and then if you're a five-year working camera operator you can apply to get your initials after your name so when I get my credits on some of my jobs it's Jessica Lopez SOC which stands for Society of Camera Operators. You've shared a lot with us and we're very grateful but I have one more request in case you forgot anything you wanted to share Based on your experience in the industry, do you have any recommendations that you feel can benefit our beautiful students who are aspiring to be cinematographers? That you missed uh, this discussion. I'll jump right into it. The one thing that I've found for my success is actually being a part of these organizations. The Society of Camera Operators I joined back in 2008 um, I was a member of the Steadicam Guild for a long time. That was I started that in 2007. I've been a part of Camera Women Los Angeles for three or four years. And all those, I've volunteered my time for no pay. And I've put together events. I've gone to these events. I've represented the organization. I've networked with a lot of people. Um, today, because of the efforts of me and a few other people, we have things like the Stabilizer Gear Expo, which is Right after Cinegear, there's this event in Film Tools parking lot in Burbank, California. And basically, anybody that's interested in Steadicam can go around and try on every Steadicam that's out there from all the different companies, from the Bentley of Steadicams all the way down to the Pinto of Steadicams. <laughs> this depends on what your preference is. You have the monitor companies, the follow focus companies, they're all there. And it, you know it's a great little community. We're going in the seventh or eighth year now. And it is all because some of us just decided to have our own event and put it together. So all those things that I've done over the years and have networked with all those people over the years and have volunteered my time, that's, that's good karma. And that is also coming back to me now, down the line. Now that I'm working, now that I'm in the union, now that you know I have a good body of work under my, under my name and a good reputation, all those people that I volunteered for that have seen me work, are now recommending me for jobs or asking me to come on their jobs. So giving back and being a part of something is definitely a good place to advance because nobody's just gonna give you things. You have to work for it and you have to prove yourself. And a good place to start is by joining organizations. And since you all are students, the SOC has a great deal for students. Um, and you get to be a part of those events. And honestly, being in San Francisco, 
the SOC could use more events out here. So that means you guys can plan these events amongst yourselves and have your own little community and grow together. And once you pay all those dues and give all that time in the future, five, six years from now, guess who's working on whose jobs and who's got what? Everybody that's already been coming together for years that already have that trust and dependability. Sorry, I keep talking too much. Thank you, very good. Do you have any recommendations uh, for students aspiring to be uh, professional cinematographers? Um, definitely, as I said before, shoot everything you can, mm -hmm. but always try and be like a, and be positive because people are going to pick up on that if you're negative, if you're not, if you're not great to work with and stuff. Mm -hmm. Because and, and that's what's going to get you further along because reputation because as independent contractors, your reputation is your work. Um, and then kind of going off of what you were saying earlier about learning like the lingo and how to act on a set, being, I kind of like to work with the, with the mindset that if nobody notices me doing my job, then I'm doing my job. So kind of being a fly on the wall and observing as much as you can and doing your job efficiently and being positive, that's one major thing that I would have helped if I had known that right away. Um, I think everything I'd suggest has been touched upon. Um, positive attitude goes a long way. Um, always be on time, but in the film business, early is on time. If you're on time, they consider you late. Mm -hmm. um, and also relying on your college. This has been talked about, but when I was starting out, um, all the second ACs, we liked each other, we liked to work together, we liked to hang out, but we didn't talk much, and we didn't talk money much. We didn't compare what kind of rates we were getting, what money we were getting for kit rentals, and um, I think it's really good to rely on your colleagues to get their advice when you're not sure about something, but also to try to be on the same page about what sort of money you're going to be asking for when you get hired and um, what you all expect. Um, in the past couple of years, a lot of LA production companies have asked um, crews working on, on commercial productions to work for 12-hour deals instead of 10-hour deals. And um, we kind of lose money that way. So when you have a, a group of people really sticking together demanding the same things, it's it's easier to get what, what you want. So um, so definitely rely on each other. And even if you're going out for the same jobs, you don't have to look at it as being competitors. You're just people doing the same thing, and you need to support each other and work together because there are the people you're going to be working with. There are people who are going to be recommending you for jobs. There are people you're going to hope will cover you if you get sick or want to go on vacation. So... Um, so that's a good thing. There's a lot of um, glamour around the film business, you know. And I read, um, I'm on the admissions committee at USC, and we read the students' applications. And um, it's not unusual that I'll read an application that starts with, when I accept my Academy Award, this is the speech I will give, right? And this is from an undergraduate. This is from like a, an 18 year old. And, and while I think it's great to have dreams and ambitions, um, I, I think that you need to love what you do. Because um, most of the time, for all the hours that I have spent in my career, um, the, the number of hours in which I've been recognized or awarded, are the ratio is very small. So, so you really need to love it. And if you're going into it for the wrong reason, you're going to be very disappointed. Um, it is the work. And if you can really enjoy the work when we can get it as freelancers, right, um, you'll, ha you'll, you'll feel successful. But if it's about the recognition and the awards and all that kind of stuff around it, you may be very disappointed. Um, and the other thing that I think is, and I still struggle with this myself, to be very honest, and that is to not compare yourself to other people. And, and, it, and it's inevitable that we do it. We, 
you go to school with somebody and we stay in, in an organization with them and then you get the, this is the dreaded phone call like, hi, what are you doing? Nothing. What are you, oh, I'm on a set. Oh, I'm not on a set. You know, and you start watching, you know, where your career is versus where their, their career is. And that is, that it's a killer. It's a killer emotionally for you. I think it destroys those relationships that you really want to use to help each other rather than to compete with each other. Um, and you're not, and you, and you lose your own, you know, path that you're on. I mean, we're all in, in this to, to, to grow. We could be in the film business, we could be making sandwiches, we could be doing a number of different things. We happen to pick film. And I think that, as, that basically what we all want to do is grow as people. And um, so the way to do it is to stay focused on what are your goals, what's important to you, and um, what do you want to accomplish out of this? And if, if sometimes you start to grow ahead of your peers, that's great. But then there'll be times you slink back. This is true of life itself. Um, but, but just to, to, to say, it's okay. I'm, I'm on my path, and this is what I need to do. And, you know, coming over here, it was amazing the stories that, that you were sharing with me. I mean, like, I never had to live in my car, and Jennifer was saying she had to live in her car. So it's, it's Jessica. Like a, I'm sorry, what? I'm sorry, Jessica, I'm, I apologize. Um, so, so that was like, wow, look how much harder she had to work than I had to work um, to get where she needed to be. But I admire you for that. So, so I think stay clear on your path and love the work. Um, I think it's time for us to take some questions from the audience. And there's a mic that's... Uh, Okay. Fine. Uh, or being paled or something. So I definitely, safety is number one. It's not worth anybody's life, no matter what. I say, if I'm about to fall, just, you know, let the equipment go. Don't worry about it. It doesn't matter. So, um, yeah, it's horrible. Um, we've all been in her position and had had to make those decisions. And I know I've made really, really dumb decisions where I look back to it, I'm like, I should have never done that. I should have never put myself in that situation. Um, but we, you know, that the pressure. Yeah, it's the pressure and what you were saying, it's not worth it. It really was a wake up call for all the unions, the whole, not just the unions, but the, all of the film industry and probably beyond because it was a tragedy. But um, I think that we're much stronger and we're much more aware of our safety. And that's one thing also that you don't realize while you're first starting out. Just, I'm going to do everything I can do. I'm going to put myself in whatever it, whatever it takes to, to get there, to, to get where I need to go. But it's not worth it at all. Let me just interrupt. Um, for those of you who don't know, Sarah Jones is a camera assistant who was on a shoot in the South and there was an accident on a train track. Uh, the uh, shoot wasn't organized very well and uh, she was killed. So. And by the way, that director had a history of um, breaking the rules and he pushed it to the point that this unfortunately had to happen and um it's really sad and i and i agree i i in my career i did really stupid things because and i think it's because i thought i had to prove myself as a woman i did things that guys said to me i'd never do that and i thought oh well, i'm not going to do it anymore either but i thought i had to prove and and i suspect there might have been some of that going on too and it's okay to walk away you'll get another job it, that actually happens to me a lot. If, it, if it's unsafe, I say no. If my body's given out because of the strain of the job conditions that you're asking me to do, and I say, I'm not going to do this anymore. You're, my back, you know. It, and they're looking at me like, and if I, I've explained to you what was going to happen when you asked me to go that low with the steady cam. I told you it took an extra piece of equipment, all this kind of stuff, and they just start playing, well, I, I didn't know any better. It's like, I'm sorry. Please don't hire me ever again. I am okay with it. And it's also okay to ask questions on set, too. If you're working in the street, you can ask, you know, who's locking up the street, those sorts of questions. 
And also driving home at night is a big safety concern. A lot of people I know have fallen asleep at the wheel. And we've also had camera assistants die because of that. So um, that's just also something to keep in mind. If you have to pull over or request a hotel room from production, they're pretty good these days about giving you one if you need it. Actually, a few steady chem ops and I, we share a personal assistant pretty much. She's She comes out, she runs errands for us, but after like say a long day, we're on set 12, 14 hours a day and we have to drive somewhere and it's a pretty long drive. She'll usually give us a, a ride or be our co-driver or something. Like she's really nice in our little community of friends. It's always nice to have somebody you can rely on to do those small little things. Yeah, I hear you say the process of our team having the time to raise the and you get called in the back to the person who says to be the Um, well, uh, it, it depends. If you're working on a feature, there's a lot more preparation that goes into it um, because you're thinking of the long term. If you're doing commercial, there's a little less prep work into it, but generally you'll either get hired on by the first AP um, or the director of photography, depending. In, in terms of a camera, it's our second, second AP. Sorry, I should backtrack there. Um, and then production will generally call you, talk to you about your rates and your hourly, or how many hours you're expected to be there um, over time, all that stuff. Um, and then you can choose for me as a second, a lot of times, like I said, I don't get invited. I don't get paid for props, but I'll generally send by because that's how I keep up. That's how you keep good rapport with the person. You better prepare yourself for work the next day. So that's and also, I'm finding as a second AC that more and more, um, I'm not finding anything out before the job. Sometimes <laughs> a first AC will put me on hold. I'll never talk to production about my rate. I'll call up the first and say, hey, what camera are we using? And he'll tell me that. And he won't even know what else is happening because maybe he's busy on another job um, or no one's telling him anything. And then the night before, I'll get a call from production with my call time. And I show up, and maybe I know the camera, but not much more. I don't know what my rate is. And you just jump in and have to figure it out. And that's part of the job, too. Um, just figuring things out at 5 o'clock in the morning when it's still dark and with somebody maybe that you've never met before. But that can be part of the fun. One hundred percent, you have more of a respect for what I feel like you have more of a respect for what you're doing because you appreciate film and how beautiful film is, and you can also understand how people are trying to replicate that with video. Um, but I also think that with film, learning film and in school, it affects the way that your mind works because a set runs a certain way generally. Like when it was film, I think it was more regimented. You know? And that transfer into digital kind of flopped it up a little bit. You know, it's mm -hmm. a little sloppy. But um, learning film and going through that process is something that not very many people will get anymore. So you just have much more respect for what you're doing. And you understand the process of how, of light and lenses and how all that inter works with each other. Digital can be beautiful. Um, but understanding how certain things interact with film, I think, makes you just appreciate when did you come up with as well. I hope that answers your question. Mm -hmm. Hi. Um, thank you guys for coming to this. Um, I wanted to ask a more personal question uh, because it's something that I think about a lot as a um, student life and also a student. 
Um, do you think pursuing this passion as a career relates to the goal for you to build a new community relationship? Yes. Yes, it does. I mean, most of the male cinematographers that I know have families. And most of the female cinematographers don't. Or they take um, a, like a, a leave from it when they're having children. Um, the other thing I can definitely say is that most of the women cinematographers that I uh, had as students at USC, often they end up uh, shooting documentaries rather than fiction work. I don't know if it's just their personal preference, their interest, or that somehow the way that you work as a documentary cinematographer kind of works a little bit more with your um, family lifestyle. But yeah, it's a, it's, it's a choice. Because the truth in LA is if you tell two times in a row you're not available for whatever reason, the rumor is, oh, she's not in the business anymore. So you, you cannot walk away from things and then come back. Conversely, I, I, I interviewed uh, Manuel Labisky uh, one time when I was teaching at USC, I mean AFI, and he actually said that he did take a leave when his son was born, and yet he was able to come back into the industry and resume his career. How he did it, I don't know if it's a male-female thing, but he did do it. Um, lately I've watched, I, I, well, over the past few years I've seen some amazing talented cinematographers cinematographers that are women do it while they were pregnant. Um, Rachel Morrison just had a baby and she was working literally almost up to when she was giving birth. Reed Murano I think has worked during every one of her pregnancies and they look great doing it, holding the big Alexa on their <laughs> I'm on glad their to hear with this. I'm really glad her. to hear this. Yes, um, uh, really amazing uh, DP Kimby I worked with her in, in LA, she just had a baby. It, it seems to be very, very um, frequent now. These women are just doing what they can and, and the dads are happy to stay at home with the family while the women are out doing what they have to do. Um, for me personally, I dedicate everything to my career to where I was just telling a young lady back there, I don't have relationships, I don't have anything other than a steady cam, property-wise. Um, my mind is all about my career. I've sacrificed all that other stuff. And I think I needed to do that in order to get to where I am because it's been so rough. And if I had any other kind of distractions, I wouldn't be here today. Um, I, I, I compare myself sometimes to my cousins. I have a couple cousins that are all around the same age. And all of them were very bright, beautiful young women that had very wonderful ambitions in life to go places. But in the end, because they chose to be with their boyfriends, they decided to go the family route and never got to pursue their careers. But that was literally right out of high school or right out of college. They never had a chance to work in their profession before they started becoming parents. So if you do want to do it, my advice is to definitely get out there and just work, work as much as you can. And then when you financially feel like you're secure enough, then go off and start your family. Um, I, I'd say that's probably the safest bet because your child's going to want you to be as successful as possible so you can focus on them. Sometimes you don't they have... They can be your camera assistant then, your kids. I'm sorry? The kids can be your camera assistant then, right? Right? <laughs> well, I, I really don't think I'd be a good parent, honestly. I'm kind of I'm kind of loving what I'm doing now with myself. But sometimes I get lonely, but I can make up for that just by getting back into the study camp. <laughs> I know. It's done again. <laughs> I, uh, I think that's where your relationships come into play, because if you work with a crew or several crews consistently, and they're your really good friends, they become like family. And so, you know, if you wanted to have a family, I think you should do it. And then from there, you know, hopefully it'll all fall back into place as long as you maintain those relationships with people. Everybody's going to support you. Nobody's going to be like, you, sh you shouldn't need to do that. You shouldn't need to have a kid. But, you know, I think as long as you have those relationships with people, you should be able to fall back into it. 
then it sounds like it's generational, and I'm happy to hear this because, you know, most of the women that I know who were successful and are near my age, they didn't have families. So it's wonderful to hear that um, it's possible. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy for that. Hello, you guys. Um, from you guys' experience and appearance, I will ask you guys uh, what the difference uh, 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 the same probably work in promotion, uh, TV show, and the uh, film. What the difference is between that? Great. To pay. <laughs> <laughs> Also, commercials are shorter term, features are longer term. Um, one's kind of, you go to work, you do it, and you go home and you sleep like a baby. The other one is, on a feature, you go to work, you're on it for a long time. You might not sleep like a baby every night because you know you're, you've got a lot of pressure on you the next day because this big little crane shot is coming up or something like that. So. I also think it's changed in that um, years ago, uh, people who worked on television shows were ra rarely also working on feature films. You were either in one world or the other, or you were a commercial cinematographer, and there were very distinct categories. Um, some lucky people were able to maybe do commercials and features, but the world of television and films were very different. and. Uh, features were considered the higher level and television was kind of poo-pooed. But after the cable world came in and the look and the type of projects and um, you know shows that they have on cable, then things changed totally. And because they were so innovative and so well-written and so engaging um, that they attracted the people who were looking at some, you know, that were really interested in features, and so now people go back and forth much more easily. It's much more fluid be going between those worlds as a cinematographer, which, again, it's the, I think it's fantastic. Hi. I just wanted to ask you all about the future and what made the goals you have to talk to I want to win the lottery. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, I do have to admit, I'm at a certain age where I am thinking more about what is my next step, and I actually haven't figured that out yet. I love what I do. I want to keep doing it. It's a very physical job, though, and I remember being 25 and thinking, I can't do this when I'm 30, and then I was 30. I can't do this when I'm 35, and then 35. I can't do this when I'm 40. I'm going to stop there. But, um, <laughs> Anyway, I actually don't know because I don't know if I can still be doing this. I'm a career second AC and we always we carry a lot of heavy stuff and I don't know if I can still be doing this in 10 years. But also I said that 10 years ago <laughs> and it helps keep me in shape. So, um, so I don't know. Either I'll still be doing the same thing or I'll win the lottery if I start playing it or I'll have to figure something else out. I just don't know what that is yet. Um, let's see, for the future for me is motion pictures, motion pictures, like blockbuster motion pictures, movies that I would go see as a kid, I grew up behind a movie theater, and I, we had the coolest video store down the street, so I knew I was going to be in some sort of filmmaking since I was younger, I've been obsessed with it, so I think for me, satisfaction. I, I will have fully made it the day that I can run with a steady cam on the set of a Christopher Nolan movie or a Quentin Tarantino movie. And I don't think that's far off. I mean, they might be retired by the time I get there, but <laughs> that that is my future and I can't stop until I make it to that point. And there's only been one other female steady cam operator to make it to that point. And she's a mentor and a close friend of mine. Her name is Liz Ziegler. You can look her up, but she did Eyes Wide Shut for Stanley Kubrick. And that was like the mecca of all jobs for at least her in her career. I hope I could get as close to what she has accomplished in such a, a short time. Sadie Kim's only been around for this year, is 40 years. 
I want to be a cinematographer. Just like all of you. Uh, I want to make that transition. It's 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 not going to be easy, but that's that's my my hope for the future. I just want to be as continually engaged in the work that I do that I am right now. I don't I don't necessarily know what it's going to be, um, but but the amount of involvement that I have is really important for me. I have a question. Wait, as a female have you ever met a situation that like, your school they doesn't take you really seriously? But especially you know, when you're on set, like you are trying to push yourself, push to set like better lighting, like um, very set, but they just your school doesn't take it very seriously. How would you manage that situation? I think you have to be careful who you hire. I've had to fire people who have um, defied me or just made the set uncomfortable or challenged me. You need to really be, um, to set a tone that says that I'm willing to take, uh, hear your feedback, but once I make a decision, that's my decision. And if there's someone on the set that doesn't go along with that, you need to, um, I think it's really important to, to let them go. Because if you don't, it starts to feed into other people on the set. I think um, for me, as that's still, I mean, it's, all, it's a constant struggle for all of us, but I'm young and I'm a woman. But sometimes you kind of can read people that might not be taking you seriously, but if you just ignore it, and unless it's something very serious, then don't ignore it. But if if you just kind of brush it off your shoulder and you and work really really hard and not you have to prove that you don't have to prove to anybody that you can do your job as long as you know that you can do your job. So if you keep that mentality, people are naturally going to accept you and understand that you can do your job as good as anybody else. There's some successful, I mean, cinematographers and again, Liz, the lady I was just talking about, said he can operate. They've never really had to face much discrimination, believe it or not. And it is a lot to do with their background and their interests. Liz, before she became a Steadicam mom, she was a master machinist. Like she ran the machine shop at Disney for 10 years. So she knew everything about metal and torque and all this kind of stuff that it didn't matter if she was a woman or not. She was qualified to do the job above and beyond what was required of her because of her skill set so that that might also be a good thing being a woman in this industry is knowing your shit knowing how to do what it is you're there to do and people won't judge you but then again there's some people that will it's just life it's how we function as humans i just want to say really quickly i don't I don't feel, and like it could have been different a long time ago, I don't feel like I get judged a lot because of the women. Just like to throw that out there. I don't, I don't know what your experiences are, but that's just, I get judged more so because I'm younger or I'm smaller more so than I'm a woman. Gender's never really, I've never really seen it be an issue. You know, I kind of answered your question as somebody who is a cinematographer and in charge of the crew, but I did think of an event when I was a camera assistant, there was this Dolly Grip who continually teased me about being a woman on the set. And I wanted to confront him in front, and the other guys around were, were going along with it. They were laughing. And what I decided was that I had no power to confront him in front of these other people. But what I did is I waited in the evening when I was on the camera truck with the other guys, the, the operator and the and first assistant, I was the second at the time. And I went up to them one-on-one -on -one and I said, you know, when he starts making those jokes, it really offends me. And I'd really like, if it happens in the future, if you would kind of consider my point of view. And they were very embarrassed by it when you do it one-on-one. -on -one. I mean, bullies like to be in crowds. That's where they gain their power. And I said it to both the first AC and the operator. And then the next day when the dolly grip started acting up, I thought, okay, what's going to happen? Are they going to go along with them like they did in the past? And they didn't. The operator turned to him and said, it's not funny anymore, just drop it. 
and he had no audience. He had nobody to, to play with him. And it turns out that I just recently hired that operator to teach for me. We're friends. I have a long um, well, uh, luckily before I graduated, I, I had gotten into the film community a little bit. I um, did a feature actually with, with Chris Pastel. Um, uh, uh, I don't really know how, like, how the first job came. You just have to network really um, and keep your expectations low in terms of you, know, you might have to, you might have to work for free a lot. We definitely work for free a lot, um, and work hard. But um, try and work before you get out of school, whether it's being a PA or you know being a like a camera PA or an electric PA or you know production design PA. Just um, try and do that because you'll find that everybody gets work slightly differently. I mean, we all have to get our own work, but you'll figure out which way works best. Some people cold call, some people contact, some people, um, you know, they, they, they get work through other people, like who need covers, that's how you meet other people, like, oh, I can't do this job, I'm, I'm not feeling well, so this person's going to come in to me, that's how you expand. Um, and every job is like an interview, so treat it as such. Um, but yeah, definitely just try and, and get some experience before you leave because school is kind of like your little safety blanket and then once you get out it's the real world and it's, it is terrifying but it's definitely definitely manageable if you can pick up work at a camera house of some sort a rental company that's the best trading possible because you're meeting all those people that are coming in and out that are on the jobs that you would like to be on one day so you're meeting them, you're talking to them, you're getting to know, hey, you want to come help us out this weekend? Sure, I'm not working. So it's, it's almost like those camera houses, I like to say, is it's like film school, but you get paid to go play with equipment. Mm -hmm. Panavision was literally one of the best jobs I've ever had. And they had a great medical plan. And I had free time on the weekend to go and do small jobs for people. I worked with AFI students and Chapman students and UCLA students. And yeah, so the best knowledge is hands-on. And the only way to get hands-on, really, without people worrying that you're gonna drop things, are at camera houses. And there's plenty of them in California, for sure. Yeah, I actually interned at Lee Otterbach, which is closed down, um, but there's like, this chater, there's a lot. Try, yeah, definitely try and get some sort of internship, even if it's not at a camera house, if it's something that involves production. And also, find out maybe some of your fellow students are already working on shoots and maybe they can help bring you along on some jobs to work as a PA. The biggest change I saw after that event, after Brad died, was that production companies would offer hotel rooms once you hit a 15-hour day, which I still find kind of funny because 15 hours is an awfully long day, and that seems to be kind of the, the minimum before they you know, really offer up a hotel room. Um, besides that, I think the days are, you know, they maybe got a little shorter for a little while, but they're back to being long. Although I think I've found with the economy kind of shifting, some of the production companies don't want to go into so much overtime. So I think that's kind of pulling things back a bit, but it's more because of money as opposed to safety. And the lower the budget, the job, the longer probably the hours you're going to work on set. And they definitely aren't thinking of safety at all. They're just thinking of how much they can get out of you before everybody falls to the floor. A big trend that's happening is music videos. You're on a 14 hour day. Um, 
just every job is negotiable. So <clears throat> if they come to you and say your rate's based on 14, you can say no, and they can say obviously that they're going to look somewhere else, but you can really fight that. But um, I find just voicing it, okay, we're going to be on this 14, but if you go any longer, or if you don't feed us the second meal, or um, then, you know, it's going to be a problem. Hi. Uh, for being a, um, a woman cinematographer, how uh, big the challenge it was for you to be in, um, hired on set, and especially for uh, Jessica as a steady cam operator, to, to be like uh, holding most of the heavy equipment and gears. So um, how, how big the challenge is that they hired you for being a woman? Um. Basically, I, it takes time getting used to it. Your body has to develop to what it is you're holding and carrying. Uh, when I first started with Steadicam, it was actually very hard to hold up. And then it's just muscle memory and training. Uh, I have a gym membership. Yoga. Yoga is wonderful for everybody. I do like 10 minutes of set yoga every day. I actually will I'll do it with the stand-in. The makeup girl, whoever's just hanging out, we do set yoga for you know a few minutes, and it's it's nice. It just take care of yourself and eat right and hiking. This is a great place to do some hiking. That builds up endurance. Um, but yeah, as a as a woman steady cam operator, I do get a lot of assumptions from women and men on set. Like, oh well, I didn't know you could do that until I saw you do the first shot and yeah you're good yeah, you got this I, I showed up to one set last month I remember it, it every job there's at least one person and I showed up to set and this one girl she was in the grip department she's looking she's like is that a steady cam I was like yeah she's like are you a steady cam operator I was like yeah she's like oh cool and then she walked away and when my shot was up when it was time where was she at in video village watching every single thing I did, just waiting to see if I would mess up or something. And to me, everybody's cheering in Video Village once the steady cam shot gets pulled off. So it was like, hey, yeah. It just, it, there's a little bit of, there's a little bit of negativity because for some reason there's a stereotype out there that a steady cam operator has to be a big, huge, muscular man. When honestly, I think it, it comes down to having poise and being graceful and delicate. It, it's not something to be aggressive. You have to have that finesse, that ease into it, the touch. I let whatever's in the frame tell me how to do the shot. I, 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 um, I train myself where it, requires a good eye-hand coordination. So like first-person video games are very good for that. Um, peripheral vision. I love to roller skate. I'm a roller skater. That's my like useless talent. I've been roller skating since I was two years old, like professional speed skate type stuff. So I can go backwards, sideways. So I have really good footwork. I can never trip over my feet. And what's great about roller skating is it, it trains your peripheral vision. I'm always looking over my shoulders because I can't see behind me. So that makes me even better at my job because I can already anticipate someone that's behind me coming all the way across and landing over here. And I know that I have to follow them from super wide all the way to a tight close up. It just, let's hope the AC can keep up too because that's, I'm only as good as my focus cooler, honestly, and we're a team. What is it? That movie um, Pacific Rim reminds me of what it is to be a steady cam and a focus puller. You guys have to be perfectly in sync with each other for it to work out, or it's just, it's just gonna be butting heads. So yeah, um, just I train immensely. I, I train my body and my mind and my health. And I was a pre-diabetic for years. I actually weighed probably 70 more pounds than I do now. And once I realized steady cam was going to be my future, I stopped eating all that junk and I started eating more fruits and vegetables and I started going on hikes and started. So yeah, I feel, I feel really good and confident with myself and that leads to me doing a better job out there. I, I hope that answered your question. Yeah. 
Hi. Um, I have two questions, actually. The first one is, um, as an international student, it's pretty difficult, I think, for us to find like a legit internships or like work since well, they meet certain requirements, um, like your screen numbers or whatever. Um, do you have any suggestions of, uh, for us to get like basically a way uh, like to get up there? And the second one is specifically for Linda Brown. Um, since you have a bachelor in uh, psychology uh, as well, have you ever used um, like compose your shot or uh, light your uh, films and use your psychology mm -hmm. uh, bachelor to compose all those stuff in order to affect your audiences and to affect the stories too? I'll start with the one you had for me. I don't know if I can specifically answer to say, yeah, I, I can make a relationship between the two, but I, but I will share this story with you. Um, years ago, there was this director who was telling a story about trying to direct a certain actor to do something the way he wanted the actor to do it. And I, and I, I believe in science, and, and, and I have like, I like math, and you know, I like formulas, and can, can predict things. And this specific direct, director kept working with this actor, and kept trying to get her to do the scene in a certain way, and it was like take one, two, and then we're up to take 20. And finally the actor goes off and does this shot exactly the same way he wanted her to, and he runs up to her and he says to her, help me understand, what did I say to you this last time that got you to do what I wanted you to do? <laughs> and she looked at the director and she said, I didn't listen to anything you said, I just looked at the twinkle in your eye. And when he told that story, I thought, can it be true that I'm now in a career that anything I say and all the math and all the psychology and everything that I think is really working to my advantage, it turns out to be the twinkle in my eye. It's that crazy, and I'm afraid that might be true. <laughs> you answer your first. <laughs> I can't I can't follow it with a twinkle in my eye, sorry, but um, I would say you might not get college credit for it, but find uh, a VP, find a, a camera assistant, just say, I want the camera to do it for you. And, um, you know, they might not let you touch everything at first, but once they get comfortable with you, that's, I mean, that's where you're going to learn it. Like, you can know, like, like being a, like a rental house is great, but like when, um, when you see it applied, not just understanding where this this plugs into this, and this is, this power is this, and maybe once you see it applied and the different uses of particular equipment and how visually everything looks, um, that's that's going to benefit you a lot. So you might not get school credit for it, but find somebody who will take you under their wing and can create. Okay. Also, be very persistent. Too. Um, a lot of us are really busy with our own lives. We're not going to remember to call you when you say, hey, I'm looking to help out. Can you give me a shout when you need somebody? When I need somebody, it's more than likely I'm thinking about 500 other things too at the same time. So you just have to constantly keep refreshing them and keep reminding them, stay on their radar. Like, hey, I'm still here. I haven't gone anywhere. I still want to work with you. And that's how I got my mentors. And I just stay on top of it. They will say yes eventually. And, you know, persistence goes a long way. It really does. But there's also something to be said for too much persistence. Like, you got to find a good balance between keeping in touch but not actually bothering the person that you're calling because then that will turn them off too. And it's hard to know what that balance is. You just have to kind of feel it out. Yes, I was too persistent once or twice. I will say that. Okay, because the time limits, I uh, have two questions, but I only will ask one question for Linda. So it's a very personal question. So uh, I want to ask what's the difference between a documentary cinematography and uh, like normal cinematography in film industry? Because, uh, well, I don't see there, I don't see that there is a difference. Um, many of the people that I teach with at USC, um, they, they shoot both fiction and documentary. Um, I think when I first moved to LA, the worlds were very different, and I actually had two different demo reels. I had a demo reel that had documentary work on it, and a demo reel that had fiction work on it. 
And then slowly but surely, I started mixing the two because people would call me and say, um, can I see your reel? And I'd say, tell me about your movie. And they would say, it's an indie film, which to me was a red flag that they meant handheld. And so then I thought, okay, they mean documentary. And then the funny part is I put documentary work on it, and then this guy calls me back one time, and he said, I like your reel. It's got reality television on it. And I'm thinking, I never shot reality television. And I said, I don't know what shot you're talking about. And then he described it, and I said, oh, I call that documentary. So today, people go back, back, back and forth a lot. Um, some people don't. Some people are like, I just do fiction, and that's all I do. And, and they, they, I think they think documentary is beneath them. There's that attitude. It's a very kind of snooty attitude. To me, an image is an image, and sometimes some of the most unadorned images, unslick images, but most powerful images, are the ones that we find in documentary. Yeah, I just wanted to know um, how do you guys prepare yourselves physically or mentally for uh, cinematography? Because I know it's a physically demanding job. Uh, working helps to keep me in shape, just the act of being at work and having to carry stuff around. And uh, yoga really is a great thing for both strength and stretching. And working a lot too, as you said. Um, and if you're not working, you definitely gotta work your body somehow. No matter you know, what, if, if it's running or if it's yoga or something, also um, you need to be careful of how you eat and how you um, how you treat your body while you're working. Mm -hmm. Be aware of what you can do to build your strength while you're doing that, because carrying cases around is like your own set of weights. So. Um, a lot of people do CrossFit in the industry, uh, yoga or CrossFit, try and do it safe because you can hurt yourself. But it is definitely a great way to train for the heavy lifting that we do in this profession. I started running because I wanted to maintain my energy level between jobs. and uh, But now I do yoga and I run. And I can't, like one night I'll go, I want to do yoga tonight. Do you want to run tonight? I'll do yoga tonight. Um, one of the things that no one asked, and we were talking about this earlier, and I wanted to add, is no one thinks about the difficulty of being a freelancer. And some people are very good at the skill that they have in filmmaking, but they're not good at regulating their life as a freelancer. Um, we all make jokes about it, but, but when you freelance, there's this like fearful thought of, am I between jobs or am I never working again? And it is absolutely, I mean, we can laugh about it, but, it, but it's a real, like, sore spot. Um, and what I was sharing earlier was that I worked with a, a couple many years ago, and they were very good at what they did. They had various jobs in the film industry, but they didn't last because they didn't know how to save their money. And so after they'd have a big job on a television show and you, they made a whole lot of money and it was in the bank and those numbers looked really good, they would go on these huge vacations to Hawaii and stuff. And then when they would come back and I would like have lunch with them or something, they'd be in a panic about getting another job and put themselves into this tremendous stress because they didn't have any savings. So there's a whole mindset, I think, to being a freelancer in terms of um, regulating your energy, regulating your finances, regulating your emotional uh, stress levels about all this kind of stuff that no one ever told me about and I think is the hardest part of this um, that, that, that is kind of like the, the dirty little secret. The, the more that um, technology becomes more available in everybody's hands, uh, the harder it is for you to get work. Uh, there's always going to be somebody out there that's going to come in cheaper or for free. So you kind of just have to figure out how to stay on your ground. You got to figure out who to network and socialize with. And you're hustling. Every day of your life, you are hustling. It's like you're Paul Newman in The Hustler. You're, you're working <laughs> this room, you're working the next room. I mean, I'm already booking like two jobs right now talking to you guys. That's how like far ahead of the game I'm trying to be and ready to go. Just everybody could be an opportunity. Don't expect things from people, but you want to create. You want to feel the passion and the energy and collaborate and 
inspire and those things get people together to help each other. And also when you're not working, there's nothing wrong with learning to enjoy yourself. It's pretty nice to wake up like on a Wednesday morning at 9 a.m. and think about all the people who are sitting in their offices <laughs> at the moment. Um, so that's a nice part of freelancing is trying to learn to enjoy the downtime and take advantage of it. And you, you'll go crazy if you're not doing things in your downtime because you're thinking about not working or how you're never going to get that job again. Really Yoga is a beautiful thing outside of the set, too. <laughs> Have a rainy day fun. Thank you, ladies, very, very much for coming and sharing your ideas and uh, histories and experiences. Let's give them a warm round of applause.